In seventh grade, my family moved to Bryant, Arkansas. Um, junior high was awkward enough. Aren't I adorable? Okay, that was a pretty rough transition from the Spirit of the Lord to that, so you might want to take that picture down now. <laughs> Junior high was awkward enough, uh, but mine was worse. Bryant was a small town. Everybody knew each other. Everybody was already friends. Those groups were already together. I was the new kid. I didn't know anybody. Most people, like I said, were already friends. My awkward start was made even more complicated and worse when my mother, bless her heart, um, went with me to the first day of school. After checking me in the office at junior high, she thought it was a good idea to walk me to my first period class. There she went in, we were late, of course, to meet my teacher in front of everybody. Yes, I was the new kid whose mommy walked him to class in junior high. First couple of weeks, um, just because everybody knew everybody, I had a hard time making friends. Now, I played sports, and so my locker was next to a guy named Chris. Chris had a lot of friends. He was a nice guy. He was nice to me in the locker room. When it was just the two of us, we talked a lot. I considered him my only friend. Now, in the cafeteria, most days, I ate by myself. I didn't know anybody. And then one day, I saw Chris eating with his friends at a table. There was a chair sitting next to them empty. And so I decided here was my chance. So I went and I talked to Chris. I said, Chris, um, can I sit with you guys today? Chris looked at me, looked at the people around him and said, no, somebody is already sitting there. So I did the junior high walk of shame back to where I was and sat down. And I remember to this day, as I watched, is not a single person ever sat in that chair. I learned then that Chris was, was willing to be my friend in private, willing to talk to me when nobody else knew about it, but in public, he wasn't. Uh, he didn't want to be associated with me in front of other people. I wish it was just in junior high, but a couple other times this has happened in my life. Anybody ever experienced that? Isn't it horrible? Isn't it painful when you discover that someone pretended to be your friend or allowed you in their life, but then when it cost them something or other people were around, they weren't? Sadly, I've seen people do the same thing with Jesus. Following Jesus is easy when it fits into their schedule and Jesus just wants an hour and a half on Sunday mornings or, or following Jesus is okay when it doesn't cost them a whole lot. They're okay with Jesus as long as it's about blessings. They're okay with Jesus as long as it's about the benefits. It's, it's okay with, to be with Jesus when you get stuff for him, from him. These people have that private faith not the public one. Now I get it. Our culture pushes against uh, us. Culture pushes people to hide their faith. Your job has rules about talking about Jesus. People at school make fun of religious people. Professors, teachers, they have low opinions of people who are spiritual. Your neighbors are nice and they like you, but they also think you're crazy that you come to church so often. It's a lot of pressure. I get it. So what are you supposed to do? I mean, do you separate your private and your public lives from each other? Is it better just to keep Jesus to yourself and keep it quiet? More importantly, are you really following Jesus if you only follow him when no one is around? Now, Jesus understood the tension between private and public commitment. And he made it clear that selective following, choosing when you would follow him, wouldn't work. He expected more from his followers. We read in Luke chapter nine, verse 18. Once, when Jesus was praying in private with his disciples, he asked them, who do the crowds say I am? Now, if you notice, Jesus is with his close disciples. It's just him and his friends, and they're praying. It's a pretty private, spiritual moment. It's just them. They're all there together. But he wanted these guys to understand. He wanted them to know, well, do you, who am I? What am I doing here? Who do you think I am? But he started, instead of with them, he started with what's the conventional wisdom? What's the crowd? What are the people saying? And so they answered and they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, the one of the prophets from long ago has come back to life. Jesus looked at him and said, but what about you? Who do you say I am? At the time, Jesus had performed a lot of miracles. His, his things were happening pretty fast. And so other people were like, man, this is awesome. He's a prophet. Come back for life. But they were wrong. That was not who Jesus was. And Jesus looked his followers dead in the eye and said, but you, 
not them. Who do you say I am? And Peter, always the brash spokesman, spoke up first and said, I I know who you are. He answered, you are the Christ of God. That's sort of a clunky phrase. It's not something that just rolls off your mouth. What was Peter saying? Well, Peter was saying, you are the Christ. You are the Savior. You are the Rescuer. You are the Messiah. But more important, the way he said it wasn't just identifying who Jesus was. He was saying, Jesus, we know this is who you are. You are the Savior, and we're with you. We are with you. We, we are committed to you. We are on your side. And Peter's answer, it was the right one. It's the right answer. And in private, With just Jesus, with nobody else around, Peter got the answer right. Because it's easy to get the right answer in a private moment. It's like when you're in service just a few moments ago. And Mary Grace said, lift your hands and worship with me. What did you do? You lifted your hands and worship. After all, there's several hundred people who are lifting their hands at the same time. Or at the end of a message... Pastor Rod challenges you uh, to live a life of greater commitment or to respond to what God is saying to you. And in the safety of this space and in the, the comfort of knowing that there are other people who love and care about you, that you can make that commitment. It's really easy to sing, give me Jesus. You can have all this world when there are a couple hundred people singing it at exactly the same time. Now, when Peter said this, Jesus affirmed his right answer, and I affirm that as well in you. When you've made those right choices and decisions in this room, we affirm those. But Jesus also confronted Peter and warned them that this kind of commitment isn't really easy on a day-to-day basis. And he used that private moment to teach them about public following of him. It's an important essential of Jesus' teaching, so much so that he repeats the teaching several times over the course of his life in ministry. Paul picks up on it as well two or three times. He also underscores this and teaches the same things in his letters. This concept is an essential of following Jesus, and I might argue it is the essential for following Jesus. Now, not surprisingly, this teaching by Jesus completely disrupted what was expected. It was a shock. It wasn't what they anticipated. And that's what we're talking about in this series. Jesus' challenge for us to live unconventionally and even at times uncomfortably, to live life upside down. Look at what Jesus said in verse 22. The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of law, and he must be killed. And on the third day, be raised to life. Jesus made the future clear to them. He said, you say I'm the Christ, you say I'm the Savior, but you need to know right now, I'm going to suffer and die. Important, respected, popular people are going to kill me. But don't worry, three days later, I'm gonna come back to life. Now, for most of us in the room, this isn't a surprise. This is the story of Jesus. We know that this is what happens in Jesus' life. But can you imagine the shock on the disciples, the bomb that Jesus drops on them at this moment when he says, hey, I know I've called you to follow me, and I know you think it's going to be better and amazing, and that you've committed your lives, and you've left your life to join mine, but I'm going to die. But then Jesus shocked them even more when he said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. Talk about upside down living. Jesus said, if you follow me, you will have to die as well. I'm going to pick up a cross. You will have to pick one up too. Following me, guys, means you will have to follow me even in death. I will die, so will you. That's part of the deal. Jesus' upside down teaching, if you wanna live, you have to die, flies in the face of easy private commitments. Real followers are known by what they give up, not what they get. It had to be real quiet when Jesus was talking. Maybe as quiet as it is in the room right now. Now, don't get me wrong, I love preaching about God's blessings. I love talking about God's grace and his forgiveness, God's love. I love about looking at how to to talk about how you can live a better life with Jesus. Those are great messages. Those are true messages, but they are not the whole story of following Jesus. 
Yes, Jesus blesses. Yes, Jesus brings new life. Yes, Jesus forgives. And yes, Jesus restores what you lose. But yes, Jesus also dies. Yes, Jesus embraces the cross. Yes, Jesus demands sacrifice. And yes, Jesus even says, you have to lose it all. Now, no, no, wait a minute, Randy. This, this kind of extreme. It's, it's got like to be a metaphor or an image. Can you show me like the way you do it? Like this is going to be a trick. This means something else at the end of this message, right? Or are you saying, Randy, I'm going to die for Jesus? And those are fair questions. Um, serious questions. Especially if you want to be a real follower of Jesus. You have to deal with them. We have to look at them. So let's look closer at what Jesus actually said. He said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, die. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. Now in those two verses, you find four words that are the keys to following Jesus, deny, daily, follow, die. Say them with me. Deny, daily, follow, die. One more time. Deny, daily, follow, die. Now I'm pretty sure that those aren't the first four words that come to your mind when you think of what it means to follow Jesus. After all, they don't look really good on a t-shirt that you buy at Mardell's. But they're the essential, they're the components of what it means to be a true follower of Jesus. Now, we know in this world you will have trouble. We know that, that we have to overcome adversity and trouble and that, that that's, I think most of us at this point have come to grips with that, but Jesus' teaching here is way more than that. This is not just a prescription of how you get through hard times. No, Jesus indicated that sacrifice and denial and death is actually the necessary pathway to follow him. Believing that you can follow Jesus without much effort doesn't match his teaching. Jesus calls us to deny daily, to follow, and to die. Four words that make easy private faith impossible. So what do these words actually mean? Let's look at them. Jesus said it this way. If anyone would come after me, he must Deny himself. What does it mean to deny yourself? Earlier this year, I got a health diagnosis I didn't like. It shouldn't have come as a surprise. My diet since I was a little kid consisted basically of burgers, barbecue, ice cream, and anything fried. I'm pretty sure my grandma, Mamma, gave me chicken fried steak in a bottle. I was raised on it. But more importantly, I ate a lot. Some of you were with me. I could eat because I love food. <laughs> Do you know what happens when you eat a lot? You gain weight. Now, I blame my parents and I blame genetics. I blamed the devil. I blamed everybody. But the truth was, I love food and I love to eat a lot of it. And I got big. My doctors, my family challenged me. And this year, I've lost somewhere between 35 and 40 pounds, depending on the day. Now people come up to me and say, how did you do it? Uh, they ask me, do you, uh, what's your diet program on? What pills are you taking? What expensive shakes are you drinking every day? Have you joined a membership? What program are you on? And my answer often c confuses them because you know what? Did it worked for me, maybe not for you, but I didn't do any of those things. You know how I lost this weight? I stopped eating so much food. <laughs> I stopped eating so much bad food. Like my plate went from here to here. I eat healthier and I eat way less. And then sometimes at that point, uh, the person will say next, wow, that's awesome, Randy. I, I bet it's easier for you now. I bet you don't even miss what you used to eat. Are you kidding me? Are you stupid? I love food. <laughs> I, I want a hamburger, not a salad. I want, I want to eat French fries, not kinishua, quinoa, whatever that word is, it sounds like you're cussing when you order it. 
I want a couple bowls of honeycomb for breakfast, not just one bowl of oatmeal every day. I'm hungry all the time. I desire food. I want it. And for all my discipline, the desire is still there. You see, discipline has nothing to do with desire. Discipline is my decision to ignore my desires. For me to spend time with my grandchildren that haven't even been born yet, I have to deny what I want right now. What I want isn't important. I deny what I want for what is best for me. And let me just let you a secret. I can't trust what I want because I've wanted some dumb stuff over the course of my life. My wants have changed. And you know what? You can't trust what you want either. After all, you wanted to look cool in the 1980s, so you wore MC Hammer pants. <laughs> or if it was the 70s, you wore bell bottoms, whatever decade it was, platform shoes. Some of you still have glamour shots hanging in your house. You wanted to be one of the cool kids, so you got a mullet. Now it's 30 years later, you still have it, and it's time for a haircut. <laughs> you knew she was the one when everyone around you said, she ain't the one. You wanted to fit in. Uh, you wanted people to like you. So even though it violated everything you'd ever thought of before, you went ahead and took a drink and now you're an alcoholic. You know, no one wants to be around you now. You can't trust what you want because your wants change. Jesus said, my followers deny themselves. Your wants and desires are not as important as what God wants for you. So when God says that to us, when he says it's time to deny yourself, what is your response? It's pretty simple. It's this, Jesus, I'll give up what I want for you. Lord, it's not what I want, but what you want for me that's better. This is completely contrary to our American indulgence culture, isn't it? Because we're consumers. We are takers of things we don't need. And that same mentality, if we're not careful, will actually creep into our faith and our spirituality. And following Jesus sometimes in our culture becomes more about answering the question, God, what do I get out of serving you? What is the benefit for me becoming a Christian? And Jesus replies, what do you get? You get to deny yourself. Denying yourself is saying, Jesus, I give up what I want for you. And this is way more than just a one-time decision or something you can do in a, a matter of moments. In fact, Jesus said he must deny himself and take up his cross daily. Your commitment to Jesus is not something you just do one time. Jesus said do it daily. You can't just pray one prayer, come to one altar, raise your, heart or your hand one time. This is something that is ongoing. Daily means you have a repeated commitment. Jesus expects your full and your total commitment to him. Now that command, take up your cross, it had huge implications for followers of Jesus um, because they knew all about crosses. And today we wear crosses as jewelry. We use them as decorations in our homes. But back then there would be absolutely no way they would do that. The cross was associated with shame and death. The cross was an incredibly horrible instrument of bloody torture and death. And now Jesus has the audacity to say, I want you to take up your cross and I want you to do it every day. It even had to be confusing to them. I mean, Jesus, come on, what are you talking about? Take up your cross. The cross isn't something you do. The cross is done to you. You are put on a cross. You don't do it yourself. Why would anyone purposely choose to do this? And Jesus, do it daily? I mean, Jesus, I don't know if you've noticed, but death's pretty final. The cross is pretty, like you just do it one time and you're done. 
How am I supposed to keep doing this over and over again? Jesus, what are you saying? What are you communicating? And Jesus, we can ask Jesus, what are you saying to us? What's the response when he says you need to do this daily? Our response is pretty simple. Lord, I'm completely committed to you. Jesus, you get me every day, completely, every part. You can't expect Jesus to give you everything you want if you aren't willing to give him anything he asks. And not willing to give things to him when you're outside safe places. Not just in the safe private moments, but also in the public ones when you're out in the world. I wanna challenge you to a complete commitment. Not just when you're in a service or in a church, not just when other Christians are around, not just when it's convenient or easy, but an every day, all the time, no matter what, commitment to Jesus. Jesus continued, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Deny daily, follow. You notice Jesus didn't ask for associates. Jesus didn't ask for partners. Uh, No, he called for followers. He wants you with him. Jesus doesn't want to be added to your life. No, Jesus wants your life joined to his. Following means you release control and direction. You don't get to call the shots. He does. Leaders are followed. He's the leader we follow. And followers say to him, I'll go where you want me to go. Where is Jesus wanting to take you? Maybe a more important question is, where is Jesus taking you that you don't want to go? What if Jesus wants you to follow him to be a missionary to Asia? Are you willing to follow him there? What if Jesus is taking you to a new job? Are you willing to go to another city? What if Jesus is taking you to work in preschool ministry one service a weekend? Are you willing to follow him to the other end of the building? Where is Jesus taking you? Listen, there is nothing worse than fighting Jesus when he wants to take you somewhere. So what's our response to Jesus' call to follow? It's this, Jesus, I'll go where you take me. We follow. At our church, we use the phrase lifelong follower of Jesus to describe what it means to serve God. Why? Because that's what we believe. No breaks, no gap years, no time off. We are lifelong followers of Jesus. And that lifelong journey of transformation. When you accepted Jesus, he changed your life. But that change was more than a category shift. It's more than you just simply went from unsaved to saved or non-Christian to Christian or lost to found. Uh, There was more to it than that. He, He did change your spiritual identity, but he also changed your life's direction through his spiritual transformation. You belong to Jesus now, but you are becoming like Jesus over time. In 2003, my wife Heidi and I moved to Arkansas. Now, I was from Arkansas, but Heidi was raised a California girl. She didn't know the first thing about being an Arkansan. She shopped at Target, not Walmart. (laughs) She wanted baked chicken instead of fried chicken. Tea, just couldn't wrap my mind around it. Tea was not something you drank sweet and iced. No, tea was hot, dirty water with a lemon in it. Uh, Forget about her calling the hogs or the Razorbacks. It wasn't going to happen. She was physically in Arkansas, but she wasn't from Arkansas. Then she went to the DMV, which is a whole nother sermon. (laughs) And she got an Arkansas driver's license. That day, her identification, her identity changed. She was now from Arkansas, but there still wasn't much Arkansas in her. But... Thanks be unto God, the prayers of the saints and the power of the Holy Spirit. (laughs) She has been changed and transformed for the better. (laughs) Today, yes, preach, brother. Somebody, can I get a witness? Today, my wife is a sweet iced tea drinking, homemade jelly making, (laughs) cornbread eating woman of God. Now listen to me. 
She still won't call the hogs, but I'm believing for a miracle. Would you just stretch, would you just stretch your hand right now over to this side of the room? We're praying. Following Jesus is very much the same. You see, when you decided to follow Jesus, your identity changed. But the process of becoming like Jesus only happens when you follow him, when you become more like him. And Jesus was clear the process for doing this. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. That's die. Whoever loses his life for me will save it. Ultimately, following Jesus means you have to die. And what is your response? Jesus, I'll give you everything. Dying doesn't sound fun, but it's the upside down approach to life with Jesus. What you wanna keep, you have to give up. If you wanna live, you have to die. You are no longer in control, God is. And that phrase, lose your life, means that your old life is completely destroyed. The old way is dead. Now in the Old Testament, people would bring a sacrifice to God. Uh, they did this to thank God for something they had done. They did it as an act of worship. They did it as a way to receive forgiveness. They usually would take an animal or food. It was something of value. They, they, either they had raised or they had purchased. And they would take that sacrifice. They would, uh, play, they would kill it and place it on top of the altar. The sacrifice was complete in total. They would set it on fire and it was burned till nothing was left because God got all of it. Nothing could be used later. Their sacrifice was completely destroyed for him. And Jesus asked the same of us. We give up complete control of our whole lives. If you wanna live, your old life has to die. It has to be placed on the altar, completely consumed and destroyed. And that's what radical public discipleship and following of Jesus is. It's the way to be a real follower of Jesus. And some people, they never make it here. They want Jesus in their life, but they don't want to sacrifice or die. They're friends with Jesus in private, but not in public. They want to keep part of their lives. They want to share their life with Jesus. When you share your life with Jesus, you say, God, I'll, Lord, I'll give it to you as long as it's mutually beneficial. God, we'll use this together. I'll invite you to my life. We're gonna share. And sharing almost always means you get what's left over or you get extra. I've got a little bit more. You can have it. Sharing says, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it to you, but I want access to it in case I ever wanna pick it back up if I need it again. Sharing isn't bad. You were taught that sharing is caring, but God does not ask us to share. He asks us to sacrifice. And when we sacrifice, what we say is, God, you are allowed to have it all. God, I'll give you everything. What I want and even what I need is yours. Just like that Old Testament sacrifice, my old life, the things and desires and wants, everything inside of me, I place on the altar, I step back, put my hands in my pockets, and you get the whole thing, consume it all. What are you willing to sacrifice? What's it worth to follow Jesus? Just a few moments ago, we sang, give me Jesus. Take this whole world. Are you willing to sacrifice what you need and what you want for him? It's easy to sing, but what happens if part of taking this whole world is the Lord saying to you, are you willing to sacrifice owning the most profitable business in town? Are you willing to sacrifice being the most popular student at school? Are you willing to sacrifice driving the best cars, living in the biggest houses? Are you willing to sacrifice your most amazing vacation? Are you willing to sacrifice access to your family? Are you gonna let your children go to be missionaries across the world? What if Jesus asks for it all? Like he takes us up on the th song we just sang and he says, hey, I want you to go home and I want you to empty your savings account and give all the money to the kingdom. Or that lake house that you only visit a couple weekends a year anyway, I want you to use that for another purpose. I want you to give it to a ministry so that they can use it for God's glory. Would you do that? Would you sacrifice? Would you do more than sing this song? What if God says, you're putting other things before me? You're spending too much time hunting and fishing or playing golf. You're spending too much time with your friends. You're spending too much time on weekends with your family. It's time to make me and my church a priority. Would you sacrifice those other things? 
You see, it's easy to say, take this whole world and give me Jesus until you begin listing what this whole world includes. What are you willing to sacrifice? Deny, daily, follow, die. It's easy to say you'll do it right now in private. It's easy in this room. The temptation for me as a preacher is to tell you to bow your heads and close your eyes and ask you to raise your hand and commit. But that'd be easy. Because after all, a whole bunch of other people would do it. And the safety of this room is not the demonstration of the Spirit's power that will work in your life. This message is genuinely discovered on Tuesday when you're at work. Or Thursday when you're online with your friends. Or Friday when you're hanging out. So I leave you with a couple questions and a prayer. Will you follow in public as well as private? Will you deny yourself? Will you daily be fully committed? Will you follow Jesus wherever he takes you? And will your own, will you let your desires die for his kingdom and his glory? Lord Jesus, I pray for myself and every person in this room. Scary prayer to pray, but would you give each of us an opportunity this week to prove how deeply we are committed and follow you. I pray everyone in this room would rise to the test of when our desire gets in the way of your plan and we crucify and kill it when you take us in a direction we didn't intend to go, and yet we still follow you. I pray everyone this week will have a moment to demonstrate their faith and their commitment to you. Would you use us to show the rest of the world what public following and association with you is? Lord, help us to deny ourselves, to die daily, and to follow you. In your name we pray, amen. God bless you.